So this is the last in the level one model series, and this is other modeling considerations. So these are things that you consider generally, and a couple of these things are really important if you're going it alone and you're analyzing imaging data using your own MATLAB routines, which I kind of, I don't know, I don't think that's always the greatest idea, but I don't know. I don't know what your situation could be, but just a couple of things to keep in mind. So make sure you're ready. Remember the canonical HRF. Um, also, do you remember what collinearity is? If not, <clears throat> revisit the level one model canonical HRF lecture or and or the matrix algebra uh, lecture. All right, scaling. This is the important step where if you're going it alone, you're writing your own code, you need to make sure your data have been properly scaled. But there are two types of scaling, one which is good and one which is typically not viewed as good for task fMRI. Actually, the first isn't just good, it's necessary. Um, so grand mean scaling removes intercession variance in global signal due to changes in gain of scanner amplification. So if you scan me today and then scan me today later on, my image might be brighter later on than it is earlier. And it has nothing to do with me. It doesn't, I'm not thinking better or anything like that. It's just the scanner. So we need to remove that effect, and that's what grand mean scaling does. So this is necessary because without it, uh, we cannot combine our data across subjects because all the subjects would be scaled differently. And importantly, this scaling scales the entire 4D da data set by a single number. So it's not changing the variability of the data. It's uh, differentially over the brain. It's changing all the data in the same way and it's scaling it so the mean is approximately the same across all subjects. And this is automatically done in software packages. It's often done silently um, because there's no reason why you would ever turn this off. But that's why I'm telling you about it because it's important that if you're analyzing data on your own, you have to apply some type of grand mean scaling. Now, the other scaling is proportional scaling or sometimes it's also called intensity normalization. This is different because instead of scaling all of your 4D data set at once, it scales each volume of the 4D data set separately so that all of your time points have the same mean. So in other words, if you have 200 time points, you can think of this as having 200 3D volumes, correct? And what this is doing is it's taking the mean over each of those 3D volumes and it's equating these. So one way to do this is modeling the global signal. Um, so you may have heard the term global signal regression. Uh, so it's a big deal in resting state uh, data analysis. And the idea is to remove background activity of no interest. But problems can occur if your true activation is actually widespread. So here's a paper from 2004. The top panel shows without this type of scaling, the bottom is with. And you can see two things happen. First of all, the uh, positive activation, which is shown in red, and I, I forget the, what the task was, it doesn't matter, but the positive activation is diminished, um, and all of these negative blobs pop up, and in this case, and some of them are quite strong, it doesn't quite make sense. So it's artificially changing the results. This isn't a meaningful change. So for task fMRI, intensity normalization is never used ever. For resting state it is, it's still debatable. I'm not getting into resting state analysis today. So intensity normalization or global signal regression is not something you would do with task-based fMRI. Oh, and the reason this happens is it's, it's, uh, there's widespread activation and it's basically removing the activation. Other modeling considerations, adding the derivative of the hemodynamic response function and adding your emotion parameters to the model. So the derivative. So here is an illustration where I have the hemodynamic response function and its derivative. So what happens is if you take a linear combination of these two functions, so just pick a number, multiply it times the yellow time course, add it to some number multiplied by the pink one, you get something that looks like this. So the blue line is the sum of the HRF and its derivative. I just added them. So I did a linear combination using weights of one. And you can see this created a shifted version 
of the HRF. So what this means, and there are other ways you can shift it forward, you can shift it backwards. So the derivative allows you to shift your HRF a tiny bit. So if your assumption about when the stimulus onset occurred, or I should more specifically say when the activation onset for a stimulus occurred, because the stimulus could occur, but the actual activation in part of the brain might not be immediate, or maybe the hemodynamics are different, this can adjust for those small differences. So that's why we often add derivatives of regressors. So we model the derivative, but uh, strangely, we don't study inferences of it. We simply put it in there as a nuisance to soak up extra variability due to this mistake. And Martin Lindquist and others in a 2008 neuroimage paper suggested this is kind of a bad idea and it could lead to bias. I would say generally, we don't worry about this too much. We put it in the model, hope it soaks up the variability. Perhaps in the future, somebody will come up with a different way of doing it. Um, for now, I would say I don't think there's an easy way to combine the parameter estimates of those two regressors to get uh, kind of repaired magnitude and use that instead. Um, but generally, this seems to work fine. But it could change, right, in the future. Collinearity. When designing your study, you want your tasks to be uncorrelated. So, for example, if you have a one second long stimulus followed by a one or a half a second to a second long uh, fixation cross followed by a cue to get some feedback. So say you show subjects, I don't know, a picture, you wait for a second, and then they're given a cue to give feedback about that picture. If the feedback time is very close to the time that the picture was shown, it's going to be really hard to tease apart the signal for those two separate things. So the correlation between separate regressors for showing the picture and asking for the feedback is going to be really high and it might even be impossible to model those two things as separate events. So you want to keep the collinearity uh, reduced. Um, the correlation, if there is high collinearity, it reduces the efficiency of your parameter estimation, meaning your parameter estimates will be more variable. Uh, and it can flip the signs, but I'm, I'm not too worried about that. That'll come out in the wash in your group analysis, but it kills, it kills your power is what happens. I will talk about efficiency in an entire lecture uh, much later on, which is directly related to this. It's basically a tool you can use to make sure your collinearity isn't bad. Uh, so why is this a problem? So in this cartoon example, I have a perfect collinearity, and I've done the multiplication out. And you can see that, um, uh, what do we have here? All the subjects, this is a basically two group analysis. We have three subjects here, three subjects here from group two, three from group one. And this is saying, and it's a perfect model, there's no error. Uh, beta one plus beta two has to be set to 12. So in our minimization, we're trying to find beta one and beta two such that the sum is equal to 12. Well, I could use 10 and two I could use 12 and negative 2. I could use 7 and 5. <laughs> and I could go on forever. So there is not a, um, there's an infinite number of solutions to this problem. So this is perfect collinearity. It's um, related to when you have uh, high collinearity. It's kind of a similar issue. So more on this later, as I said, I'll, sp I'll spend a whole lecture on this, um, right? And orthogonalization, sometimes people use this and they say they fixed it. That doesn't work. And I'll have a whole other thing on orthogonalization. I have a whole paper on it, actually, a recent paper. That's it. Uh, so make sure you understand the two scaling approaches, which is good, which is bad. And by good, I, I actually should say which one is highly necessary and which one is not uh, good to use on uh, task fMRI and just know what the derivative does and are we doing the perfect thing by adding it? I don't know. It's definitely at least picking up the extra variability, but maybe that could be improved. We'll see. Great. Have a great day.